Okay, uh, our next speaker is James Ferguson. He is a genomic systems analyst who works with Martin at the Kinghorn Center for Clinical Genomics. And today he's going to tell us about the not so secret source of bioinformatics. Welcome, James. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so, this is a more memeified um, presentation compared to Martin's. Um, I come from a bit of a different background from most of my colleagues, um, not necessarily being a biologist first. Um, so, uh, just to, I'm going to go in about uh, some of the stuff I do as a bioinformatician and then talk about some of the uh, um, things that come out of that. So, yeah, I'm a genomic systems analyst, which is a fancy word for a bioinformatician that has hardware hacking skills, um, and all those big sequences and managing data and all that kind of stuff, that comes under my uh, umbrella of uh, management. So I'm freaking out about this 50 terabytes a day business because I'm still not sure how I'm going to handle that. Um, so, you know, this is, this is my reputation at work. Um, and I mostly, we mostly work with nanopore sequencing. Um, and uh, as Martin said, this is, this is what one of the flow cells looks like. Um, and that little tiny area there, that's where all the nanopores sit. Um, amazing, you, you look at it really closely, you can kind of see, like, you, you think you can see the little dots, but they're, they're unbelievably small. Um, and you, they're on a little CMOS chip, and then, as Martin showed, it goes through and you get these signals. Um, but then, yeah, that, that comes to how do we actually analyze that data, and that goes into algorithm development. Um, so one of the things I do as a bioinformatician is I can uh, create or uh, change and adapt existing algorithms to look at this data and get interesting information out. Uh, one which I've been working with lately is um, this thing called a growing neural gas. Seems to have been forgotten by everybody. <laughs> uh, I, I pulled out the original um, algorithm from a paper in the 80s or something. Um, and it's, it's fascinating. It, it starts with some little, uh, two new little neurons and then it uh, slowly moves towards um, the data and then grows more neurons and then over time it maps the topology of the data space and then you can use the closeness of all the neurons to pull out clusters. Um, I did some fun things with some text but uh, this is in two dimensions but I've made it work in you know 100 dimensions and then making it um, parallelizable for massive compute. There's all these types of little tricks you got to do to kind of get it there. Um, and, and I'm really glad that some of the implementations were all open source so you can access it and modify it instead of having to rewrite the wheel. Um, I'm also a biohacker, and if you want to know more about that, you can see Meow's talk uh, this afternoon. Um, Meow Ludo Disco Gamma Meow Meow, he's a good mate of mine. He's pretty normal. Um, <laughs> but, uh, just biohacking quickly is uh, these five things, well, this is what I say it is anyway. Um, molecular biology, bioinformatics, equipment hacking, microbiology, and grinding. Grinding's like uh, chips in your hand. Meow has an Opal card in his hand. I'm sure he'll talk about it. Um, I sit in the bioinformatics and equipment hacking space. Equipment hacking is like uh, making uh, lab equipment that costs next to nothing. You know, we've got magnetic racks that cost $1,200 to buy. We can 3D print them and glue some magnets in. It does the exact same thing. We actually use these in our lab uh, for our library prep steps. Um, and, you know, I teach uh, coding courses and intros to computational biology. And everyone in that picture is, uh, was a, uh, either undergrad, honors, PhD, or a practicing you know, postdoc, um, learning how to do some code and get into bioinformatics. Um, so what is bioinformatics? Uh, it's the merging of biology, statistics, and computer science. Um, and you know, my, I come from, I was doing physics here at UTS, um, but you know, I have a big long history of uh, computer science and hacking and information security and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I've been learning the biology as fast as I possibly can. Um, but it, it, it kind of, my experience is that even if you don't know the biology, there's so much low hanging fruit in computational biology that uh, anyone with those other two skills could easily get into it. Um, and what we do is we do things like develop tools to understand how biological data, um, uh, what biological data is telling us. Um, so a biologist might say, hey, I have this question about something, um, can, and then they go, I got this data, can you figure out what it is? And, you know, we sit there and we scratch our heads and think about, okay, how can we go through this data and find that needle in a haystack for them? Uh, one, of these, one of the really common things that we do is, you know, these alignment algorithms. This is the um, Smith-Waterman algorithm, and it's, you know, just some matrix operations. And you think about, 
if you know anything about matrices and what you can do to speed that kind of stuff up using GPUs and like, you know, parallelization, you know, computer science starts becoming very relevant and biology not so much. It's, to us, it's just, it ends up being numbers and, and then at the very end you go, hey, I found this stuff. Oh yeah, let me just turn that back into the letters you understand. And then they go, oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, it was mostly pioneered by, uh, in the early days by this lady, uh, Judith Dayhoff, which I, I think a lot of people forget. Um, she wrote this book on neural network architectures. Um, she was a mathematics professor. I'd, I'd recommend going and checking her out. She's an awesome woman. Um, but yeah, mostly we wear two hats. Um, and there's a bit of an argument about like, what is a bioinformatician, what's a computational biologist? I like to say they're basically synonymous, they're the same thing, but people will try to split them along these kinds of lines. You've got the, the people that make the tools and the algorithms, and I give them the little you know, Ubuntu hat, I might be a bit biased there. And then those that um, use tools to answer questions, um, <laughs> and they get the, <laughs> the Windows Vista hat. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit superior to complex, you know, it's like, Coders versus uh, you know IT kind of thing, you know, if if you know that 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 dynamic, um, uh, and you know I don't really care if you disagree with me, um, but mostly we're we're juggling we're juggling hats the whole time. Um, we go from one to the other. We're building pipelines. We we build a tool and then we take that tool and we stick it and glue it with all the other tools. Uh, we're basically glorified Lego brick builders. Um, it's but it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so the not so secret source of of bioinformatics um, being that it, it's mostly built on open source platforms. Um, and you know, some of the advantages of that is that you know, when we go to look at something and how something works, we can actually go into the code and read it and understand it um, and see how someone implemented it. Now this is, this is the super low hanging fruit I was talking about. Um, so BioPython, for example, is uh, a set of libraries in Python uh, that allows you to ingest and um, uh, process various file formats that are uh, unique to bioinformatics, these things called FASTQ files, FASTA files, um, and then uh, do some analysis, some basic analysis. It just gives you little tools that you can just pull in a library, do some stuff, uh, so you don't have to keep write it, rewriting that all the time. Um, but then when, when you can actually see how that stuff is implemented, and if you're really good at computer science, you can make it better and faster, and you see an implementation is purely in Python, you're like, well, I know C, Let's get like a 20 times speed up. Um, you know, when you when you understand that stuff, we when you know when you put that data in, you need to have some kind of confidence that what it's doing is mathematically correct. And if it's closed source and you can't access that information, it's just some black box. It's very difficult to have any trust in what you're actually looking at. And you know, when you're working and pushing the boundaries of of scientific knowledge, it's it's that, that can be really frustrating. <laughs> Um, the, the closed source stuff Martin was talking about with Albacore, um, I'm currently struggling with, you know, I see this output and this input and there's some bits missing and I'm trying to like reconstruct how that works and, you know, without actually getting my hands on the source code, it, it's kind of hard to do. Um, and then, uh, you know, when things break though, you know, if it's closed source, you have to wait for them to fix it. So the ability to fix bugs yourself and extend functionality within the, within, um, a particular tool is something that is just ubiquitous throughout bioinformatics. This is an example, uh, this is a fork I did on a tool called Porchop. It uh, basically reads barcodes and um, separates all the, all the different reads of DNA into, um, into their relevant barcode systems. Uh, but there was a problem where the config file was um, just a Python script that they imported as a library. Uh, I don't know if you've ever tried to do dynamic porting of a module in Python. It's pretty annoying unless you go to the latest Python 3.6.3 where um, importlib.util actually has that functionality, but everything else doesn't. It's really hard. So we, um, anyway, so I, uh, a colleague and I were trying to use this thing at the same time and we needed different settings and all this kind of thing. And when you have it on a cluster, you don't want to install something twice. So I made, you know, forked it, made a quick change, put it back on GitHub so, and, and he's going to, um, guy Ryan Wick is going to, add something like that into his uh, branch and then everyone can do something like that. And you know, he didn't have to do the work. I found the bug, I could fix it because I had those skills and now he'll, uh, everyone will benefit from that. Um, so uh, then the last thing about that is uh, when, you ha when you know how things work, you can have trust in how it works and you, know, you can see input in, input out and how everything is processed, you can have some trust in that system 
and that helps you make reliable and reproducible data where if I have some data and I run it through a pipeline and I get an answer and you have the same data and the same pipeline and run it through, we get the same answer. Um, and if we don't, then that's something we, we, we need to figure out why. And the only way you can do that is if you have access to everything. Um, so some of the disadvantages of uh, this, though, is you get, you get some scattering of, uh, um, of, of code bases. So there's no one ring to rule them all in, um, in bioinformatics, although I think in the next talk someone might say differently um, in regards to R. But uh, here are some of the programming languages that are commonly used. Um, R, Python, C, C++, Java, and um, the almighty Bash. So most of that stuff's built in Perl. But, um, you know, uh, Martin, I've seen like the craziest Bash code on the planet. It's, it's fantastic, but <laughs> it, gets to, it gets to a point where on, in a terminal it's like seven lines long, just straight like Bash. You're like, mm, maybe that should go to, turn into a script. Um, but I can't really talk because I'm currently building an automation system in AutoHockey which nobody knows. <laughs> so <laughs> this, is, this is the kind of thing that happens when there's no real like, well, this is how we do it. Um, and you can just kind of go crazy. Um, this is a common occurrence. It's like, well, it works on my machine or it works on my cluster or, you know, um, and, you know, when you've got one person that built the code and then, you know, 10,000 users that are trying to, to make that happen, <laughs> the, the ask on, you know, what well, has to work on every system becomes a bit, um, a bit much. Um, one, one tool I tried to compile uh, just four weeks ago was this thing called Nanopolish on our cluster. And it's on CentOS and it's a bit out, out of date and you know, trying to um, get things to work on it. And you know, I, I was trying to figure this out and someone just tells me, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, just, just compile the new thing, uh, like a newer GCC and you'll be fine. And I don't know if anyone's done that um, before, but that my day was basically gone. Um, and then there's all the issues from that, you know, local environment variables and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then, <laughs> the, yeah, that lack of support where someone goes to a different field or they, you know, they, they leave science or they um, go to a different institute or they change uh, their career path. Who looks after these tools that are, everyone uses every day and we, we need updated? Just some of the most common tools that we use every single day, Martin had to ping the creator and say, hey, when we put these ultra long reads in, we get like core dumps and seg faults because it goes way past the memory allocation. So you know, what, what do we do? We can't even analyze the, the stuff we want. We have to see how good it is. Um, thankfully, the, 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 the bioinformatic god, um, Heng Lee, came in and saved the day. Uh, how long did it take, Martin? Like 20 minutes? An hour. Yeah. <laughs> that guy. Um, yeah, and then uh, the, the, the greatest nugget that I find a lot of joy in is biologists learning to code. They do get eventually very good, but it's always fun to start, and I, I, I have a, a student in the room. Um, but this is some of the stuff I've seen um, come out of bioinf bioinformatics. Um, so someone trying to sleep for 75 seconds, making a for loop, and then sleeping for one second for, as they iterate through the for loop, instead of just going sleep 75. Um, or like... Um, getting the length of, a, of, a, of an input string for a, a strand of uh, DNA, and they actually do a for loop through the string and count the letters rather than just doing, you know, that, that's Python, it has a length like method. I, and, then, and then at the very end, they, they want it as um, a float, because obviously they've run into the integer division problem. So they can make sure it's an integer, and then they make it a float to, to return. Just some, you know, code nerding, but um, this leads to things like uh, consortiums being made around uh, coding practice and around uh, support um, and maintaining the, uh, making sure that these tools don't just fall by the wayside, that once someone makes something, there, is a, uh, there are groups of people that will help maintain this for, uh, for prosperity. So Bioconductor handle um, um, R and all their packages uh, and um, the Open Bioinformatic Foundation uh, handle BiPython, BiPerl, BioSQL, I don't know why that was ever made, um, and uh, BioJava. Um, and they receive uh, funding like a charity to, to maintain um, these types of uh, systems. Um, so let's just look into the future of bioinformatics. You know, we have this, this really diverse 
um, field of people that are that are all contributing to bioinformatics, making tools, making uh, systems, types of architecture, um, looking at mathematics, um, and then people who would then spend their life, you know, maintaining everything that everyone else is making. Um, and I think that the bedrock of all of that is open source. That you know, you, that we can actually see the code, understand the code, and extend the code, and that the the, the user becomes um, the developer as well. Um, I think that's that's going to continue to be the biggest um, uh, part of bioinformatics in the future. Um, however, I think that as we go through these ra rather disruptive changes in how we do bioinformatics um, and how systems change and um, new types of uh, uh, like paradigms like um, containerization uh, happen, archiving old code and knowing when to be backwards compatible and when to break that and how to have proper version control, it's going to be needed more than ever. And people who aren't necessarily software engineers, uh, they don't get, they don't go through that trial by fire th th to learn that that's a good idea early enough. And it's a really common mistake. Um, people will keep updating their master branch and then go, oh crap, um, I, I, yeah, we we need to like go back and like make release a subversion from before. Um, and then uh, I think that more computer scientists, maths, and physics majors will be going into this field. Um, problem solving, high level maths, statistical analysis, uh, in my opinion, is now more important than just the biology. Um, of course, the biology is important, but the skills required to, to do some of these massive advances in, um, in computational biology and bioinformatics is. Uh, it's not something if you you know it's not something that you just learn in a bi biology degree now. It's it's something that takes years of practice looking at the cutting edge of computing and algorithm development and high level maths. Um, and I think that if more people went into it, they'll find themselves right at home in bioinformatics because there's so many problems to solve, and they coming straight out of uni, they'll ha all have the the skills to solve them. Um, so I'd encourage anyone studying that at the moment to to heavily think about their future and consider bioinformatics. Um, and then, of course, the last thing that I think will be huge in the next two, three years uh, is containerization um, and ARM processing. We have a PhD student with us at the moment who has been uh, shrinking down and breaking up algorithms to run on ARM swarm computing um, uh, through the computer science group at UNSW and, and the Garvin. Uh, and uh, things like Docker uh, changing the way that we maintain um, versions and uh, dependencies to make things, you know, big red buttons that we can just push once and the user doesn't have to worry about all these crazy installation processes and compiling GCC and um, that kind of thing. Um, so I think I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, so this is my lab group. Uh, these, these two aren't here, but they're, they uh, enable Martin and I to do all our cool research. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any questions? All right, questions? Yep, it is doing that. Oh yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, that uh, computing is uh, not just going to ARM, but going to uh, cloud computing and distributed computing. And GPUs, yeah, FPGAs. So um, the Nanopore system, um, actually looking at FPGAs for the, the like onboard compute with the sequencing device. Um, FPGAs have been oversold a little bit. Oh, that will solve this problem for you, um, but the rapid changes in algorithms and the way that we, we do a lot of this work, they're not the technology, they're not the right technology fit. Maybe if we could change that a little bit, we might, we might do better. Um, cloud computing, definitely. Um, but there's, you know, do you do it with your, your cluster in your, in your institute or do you do it say on AWS or do you do it at NCI? These things cost money and you got to try and make that, make that call. Um, so of course we can go, we can go real big. We can, we can, you know, take up all compute that we can, but there's, you know, there's money, money issues as well. Um, 
And then the last, the last thing is uh, for ARM, um, it's uh, interesting because we've seen some massive uh, uh, time speed ups and decreases when we go to distributed ARM with certain algorithms. And when they cost a fraction of what a normal server does, it, it just makes sense. Okay, let's take another question. Uh, do we have someone else? Yes. So, question, how much of my job is reverse engineering black boxes? Yeah, thank, thankfully not too much. Um, bio, uh, open source is pretty ubiquitous through um, bioinformatics, so not too much, but there have been cases, and I'm not gonna mention which, which ones, but there have been cases where um, I've had a pretty good crack at breaking open those black boxes and gotten some pretty good results. Um, and I find it kind of really fun. Uh, but. Yeah, so I guess to summarize uh, how, do, how, do, how, how do the parallels of bioinformatics and say the financial research sector compare in regards to sharing code and how biologists learning code have kind of changed that? Yes. So, so I think the... The reason why open source is so, so uh, ubiquitous in um, bioinformatics compared to other uh, industries, I think one of the things um, is, for example, a, a comparison could be drawn between MATLAB and R, um, where MATLAB is closed source, R is open source. Um, and uh, when, when it comes to money and like licensing software and um, uh, being able to quickly adapt things and you know, the turnaround that you need, um, R has blown MATLAB to pieces in bioinformatics. Um, it's still got a pretty good stranglehold strangle in physics um, and some mathematics, but I think um, that's gonna decrease more and more. Um, and I think that other industries that aren't looking at open source um, for rapid development and change, and they're a little bit too afraid to give away their secret source, um, I think they're, they're going to get destroyed by people who do. Um, but it, it's definitely a consideration. I think it comes down to financial motivation. I think we'll leave it there. So yep. thanks, James, for a great talk. Thank you.